Just over a year ago, I spent two weeks traveling all around Iran and even though I wanted to make a video about my experiences there, right after the trip, I just didn't know how to properly tell the story because um, it's a little complicated. But now I do. Now before we get into the video, I want to tell you three very important facts about traveling in Iran. First, everyone is required to cover themselves at all times. For men, that means wearing uh, pants and t-shirts that cover the shoulders. For women, that means exactly the same thing, yet they also need to cover their hair with, with a hijab or a scarf. Second, the Iranian banking system is not connected to any other banking system in the world, which means that no international uh, cards ever work there, including the ATMs, which can obviously be a huge problem if you don't have cash. And third, most people from around the world can, can actually obtain a visa to travel to Iran, except for the citizens of Israel. Not only that, the people coming from the US, UK and Canada are required to be escorted by a government approved guide at all times as apparently um, independent travel for those people is bad. I want you to understand that everything, literally everything you see in this video are only the experiences of a of a 20 something year old backpacker traveling around with a, with a tiny pocket camera. So do not make up your mind about Iran or, or the things that are actually happening in that country based on this video alone and do your own research. That all being said, welcome to one of the most mysterious countries in the world, Iran. Iran is home to one of the world's oldest continuous major civilizations with historical and urban settlements dating back to 7,000 years before Christ, but it was first unified as a nation in 625 BC. A hundred years after the unification, Cyrus the Great vastly expanded the country's borders and created the first Persian Empire, which was the first true global superpower state ever created by man. It ruled from the Balkans to North Africa and Central Asia, spanning three continents. It was the only civilization in all of history to connect over 40% of the global population, accounting for approximately 49 million of the world's 112 million people in the 5th century before Christ. Incorporating various peoples of different origins and faiths, it is notable for its successful model of a centralized bureaucratic administration, for building infrastructure such as road systems and a postal system, the use of an official language across its territories, and the development of civil services and a large professional army. Persia continued being a true global superpower for hundreds of years, while constantly getting involved in various wars with the Greeks, Arabs, Turks and the Mongols. The country suffered particularly hard during the Middle Ages and the early modern period, as it was invaded by many strong nomadic tribes. However, Iran was once again reunified as an independent state in 1501 by the Safavid dynasty, which set Shia Islam as the empire's official religion. Functioning again as a leading world power, this time amongst the neighboring Ottoman Empire, Iran had been a monarchy ruled by an emperor almost without interruption from 1501 until the 1979 Iranian Revolution, when Iran officially became an Islamic Republic on April 1st, 1979. It took me two hours to get my visa sorted, but it's finally done and I'm officially in Iran. I arrived in Iran really late at night and honestly was quite surprised to see how many tourists there were at the airport. Quite a few more than I expected. When I finally left the airport, I hopped into a taxi that was driven by one of the friendliest taxi drivers I had ever met. And we went all the way to the downtown area, passing a few large mosques on the way. This is my very first morning in Iran and I'm super excited. I've been waiting for this moment for many years right now and it's finally here. The only thing though is that they just told me that apparently wearing shorts in public is illegal in Iran. So that's why of course I'm wearing pants. <laughs> the first day I decided to take it easy. So I roamed the streets of Tehran until I found myself at the largest market in the city that turned out to be completely massive. This market is so big, I just got lost. I mean, there's hundreds of different lanes selling hundreds of different things and it's so unclear. I don't really know where to go, but hey, it's interesting. Then I proceeded to check out the most popular restaurant in all of Tehran, where I literally had to wait in line for over 30 minutes just to get a seat. What? Look at the queue to this restaurant. It starts right here and it is over there, inside, up the stairs. It's crazy. However, the locals were really friendly and the food was great, so I definitely wasn't unhappy. Ooh, I'm so full now, I can't even breathe. 
Then I took the metro, which was a little overcrowded with commuters, and went to a popular bridge in central Tehran, from where I saw these huge mountains literally in the city center. I just came to some really cool bridge here in Tehran, and look at the view! Look at the view of the city! Wow! As you probably know, I'm definitely not a person to say no to beautiful mountains. So the next morning, I got in a cabin car and went for it. So apparently the cabin car is a little bit outdated, but the views around me are really nice. And I guess that's what counts, right? <laughs> the city is there in the background. And I'm going up the mountain, which is just there somewhere behind these hills. And it should be really nice. It took me a while to get up the mountain, but when I saw the views from the very top, it was all worth it. Apparently it's a much bigger city than I ever expected it to be. I mean, it's huge. It starts somewhere there on that side. I kind of see the, the beginning and then it ends somewhere there and I kind of see the end. While leaving the mountain, I was a little short on time, but when I saw this thing, I definitely couldn't say no. <laughs> End of track. <laughs> Woo. Woo. Dude, I thought it was gonna be really, really slow, but it was, it was a lot of fun. Yes. Later that evening, I decided to check out the sixth tallest telecommunication tower in the world. That's 435 meters tall and stands right in the city center of Tehran. From the very top of the tower, I got a 360 degree view of the whole city during the sunset, which apparently, didn't disappoint. 360 degree view of all of Tehran? Yes, please. Yes, please. As much as I enjoyed exploring Tehran, the most interesting thing I saw there was the last place I visited before I left the city. The old US embassy that was seized by the Iranians and abandoned by the Americans in 1979, right after the revolution. Before I show you the embassy though, let me tell you a bit of a background. In 1979, right after the Iranian Revolution, a return to conservative social values was enforced by the government. Among other things, revolutionary bands known as committees patrolled the streets enforcing Islamic codes of dress and behavior and dispatching impromptu justice. The militias and the clerics they supported made efforts to suppress the long-standing Western cultural influence. This anti-Western sentiment eventually manifested itself in the November 1979 seizure of the U.S. Embassy by a group of Iranian protesters who stormed the embassy and took 52 American diplomats and citizens hostage for 444 days. This event is known in history as the Iran hostage crisis, and it was the start of really tense diplomatic relationships between Iran and the United States. The crisis reached a climax after diplomatic negotiations failed to win the release of the hostages. America's President Jimmy Carter ordered the US military to attempt a rescue mission, Operation Eagle Claw. The failed attempt on April 24, 1980, resulted in the death of one Iranian civilian and the accidental deaths of eight American servicemen after one of the helicopters crashed. The crisis is considered a pivotal episode in the history of Iran-United States relations. Even though eventually the hostages were released into United States custody, the crisis also led to American economic sanctions against Iran, which further weakened ties between the two countries. These days, the former embassy has been turned into a tourist attraction and a museum that feature a number of anti-American murals commissioned by the government of Iran. This museum is called Museum Garden of Anti-Arrogance, and they have a Liberty and, and Welcome Liberty statue right here. My guide was obviously very biased, so take everything he said with a pinch of salt, but here's what he told me. The embassy consisted of two floors. The first one was for issuing passports, visas, and other usual stuff. And the second one was only accessed by 15 people and, as he said, was used for high intelligence stuff. They had this sort of equipment. It was really, really, really high-tech for those times. Yes, they really did seem to have a lot of high-end computers and other equipment that was incredibly modern for those times, including a secret meeting room. They said this room was used for top-secret negotiations, and apparently these walls, they protected anyone from the outside uh, hearing what, what was being said. You could, you could close the door, and then it was completely silent. And also you could even close this door so that no one would be able to see who's inside. 
As you know, I'm very much not into politics and I didn't come to Iran to judge the events of the past that I know nothing about. So I left the embassy right after my brief tour, hopped on a bus and left the city with the hopes to see more remote places and mingle with the local people. Salam. Salam. Eventually, I found myself in a city that used to be one of the largest cities in the world, Isfahan. Today, the city is much smaller than it used to be, but it still retains some of its past glory. It is famous for its Perso-Islamic architecture, grand boulevards, covered bridges, palaces, tiled mosques, and a massive square, which is one of the largest city squares in the world, as well as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I spent one hour walking around searching for food, but absolutely everything is closed, so... This is, this is my dinner. <laughs> the reason everything was closed in Isfahan was because I came at a very fortunate time, the first month of the Islamic calendar. That's when Muslims around the world celebrate one of their most important celebrations of the year, the morning of Muharram. The event marks the anniversary of the Battle of Karbala when Imam Hussein ibn Ali, a grandson of Muhammad, was killed by a rival caliph in the year of 680. So thousands of people go to the streets all wearing black and join a procession where drums and a few other instruments are heard as people weak to the hymns and men in black rhythmically flagellate their backs with two pairs of chains and beat their chests with open palms. Later, people take turns to hold the flag as the mourners move through the streets. There are literally thousands of people in the square right now and apparently it's a very, very big thing for them because most of them are really emotional. They come here with their families. So Hussein was a really, really important person to the Iranian people and they take it very, very seriously. The official ceremonies last for 10 days and throughout those days, the rich give to the poor in an amazing display of generosity. Free meals are on every corner where restaurant and hotel owners cook massive quantities of food and hand it out in the streets. There were hundreds of people waiting for these lunch boxes, but when some of the people working there saw that I was a partner, they gave it to me without having to wait in line because I'm a guest and the guests have to be treated the right way, I guess. Before going to Iran, I honestly didn't really know much about the morning of Muharram, but that's what travel does to you. It teaches you loads of interesting things about the people of the world. As much as I wanted to stay and learn even more, I was apparently running low on time. So I hit the road again and went to a very unique desert city called Yazd. Because of its remote desert location and the difficulty of access, Yazd remained largely immune to battles and the destruction and ravages of war. Thus, it doesn't feel like a city, more like a time machine that takes you many years back in time with its beautiful mosques, temples, handicraft shops, and restaurants that make you forget you're living in the 21st century. This old town is incredible. It seems like almost nothing has changed in the last 1,000 years or so. Of course, of course, we have cars and shops and Coca-Cola and chips and stuff like that, but, but it's wonderful. I mean, look at this. I'm currently in some really old Iranian house that's been turned into a library. There's many books everywhere. <laughs> look at this view. Wow. That's a really big mosque I just visited, and that's the old town. Everywhere you look. I felt completely at ease in Yazd, and so I decided not to rush anywhere and enjoy myself big time by having lots of wonderful food, slowly walking around, and of course, finding a beautiful rooftop cafe for sunset. The next morning, things got even more interesting as he found a local guide called Hassan Yay. who took me out of the city with his car. Our first stop was an ancient city built 1,600 years ago that looked so beautiful I could hardly believe it. Apparently hundreds of people used to live here but now it's completely abandoned because they moved to some other village with electricity and running water and stuff but I guess I would prefer living here, eh? <laughs> Yeah, these days the city is completely abandoned, which makes it an absolutely incredible tourist destination. You can go to literally any house, lane or rooftop, all the while enjoying the gorgeous mountain views surrounding the city. 
Eventually, we once again hit the road for hours, during which time we made good friends and talked about a lot of really interesting things. It turned out that my guide Hassan actually took part in the Iran-Iraq war that started right after the Iranian revolution and lasted for eight years. You see, in September 1980, a long-standing border dispute served as a pretext for Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to launch an invasion of Iran's southwestern province of Khuzestan, one of the country's most important oil-producing regions. For the first few years, Iraq Iraq occupied a large territory of Iran, but then the Iranian army recaptured the lost territories. Then the war soon lapsed into stalemate and attrition. When Hassan was sent to war, he was only 20-something years old. He told me lots of crazy war stories that still haunt him to this day, including one about him serving in the desert at night, being afraid of enemy snipers. Another one I could hardly believe was of him stepping on a mine that blew him a few meters above the ground, and even though it made him permanently limp, miraculously, he survived. We continued exploring various interesting places until we came to a gorgeous, gorgeous desert for sunset. I have no idea how a place like this can be real anywhere, really. But apparently it is real in Iran. I can touch it, I can feel it, I can smell it. It's, it's amazing. It's so, so, so beautiful. You would love it, Iran, if you wasn't it. And when you wasn't it, you want to come back again and again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> we kept walking around the sand dunes, playing dumb jokes on one another while the sun was beautifully setting in the horizon. This definitely, definitely doesn't feel like real life. At all. At all. Hassan, do you agree with me? Yes, sure. He agrees. Sure. It's natural, natural, natural. Natural. Not real, but natural. When the sun finally set, we went to a tiny desert village where we continued talking about Hassan and his life. He told me he's been working as a professional tour guide for over 19 years now, during which time he visited 20 countries around the world and learned fluent English simply by conversing with the tourists he meets. We also talked a lot about Islam. He told me that to him, Islam meant to be given to others and sacrificing your life for others. I also asked him whether he'd be okay with his kids converting to other religions or marrying people of different faiths. And he said he wouldn't have any problems with it because in his mind, everyone has the freedom to choose what to do with their lives and what to believe in. What a true legend Hassan is. What a legend. The next morning, we went to check out a beautiful ancient fort, and since we were already best friends by then, decided to film together. What would you tell to people who uh, want to visit Iran, but I don't know, they're not sure, they're still thinking about it? Oh, what Iran is very safe and very good country. People are very hospitable and, and they <laughs> uh, are very friendly and helpful to the tourists. Yes. And uh, it's a very wonderful country. Having said a friendly goodbye to Hassan, I had a perfectly fine shave for one dollar and proceeded to a city that used to be the capital of one of the strongest empires ever created by man, Persepolis. This city, Persepolis, used to be the richest city in the whole world 2,500 years ago when the Persian Empire controlled over 28 different countries. As great as Persepolis was, it unfortunately was occupied and looted by Alexander the Great and his army in the 4th century before Christ, leaving ruins of all the palaces and temples that adorned the city streets back in the day. Walking through the vastness of Persepolis, I could only imagine how the city looked in all its might. Later, I continued to my last destination in Iran, the beautiful city of Shiraz, otherwise known as the city of poets, literature, and gardens. Not only was the city beautiful, but in the outskirts they had a few large pink lakes. I never knew these things existed back then and was, apparently, quite overjoyed. What is this color? <laughs> it's pink. The water is pink. It's very pink. <laughs> it's crazy. Having spent two weeks traveling all around Iran, I was honestly surprised. I mean, I grew up hearing all these crazy stories about Iran and its people that I was actually quite frightened of going there. However, once I landed, all my fears disappeared as the local people welcomed me as if I was one of their own. 
anywhere I went. Obviously, I didn't film most of those moments, but there were situations of people not allowing me to pay for food at their restaurants or shops as I was a guest in their country. There were people who would approach me on the streets to offer help and make sure I was okay. Most of all, there were people who were so open and honest with me. They felt like family. I know that politically the situation is a lot more complicated than that, and I don't pretend to fully understand it. However, this trip once again taught me that we tend to make assumptions about groups of people based on what we were told, when reality might actually be quite different. Thank you to the people of Iran for welcoming me into their country and showing me more love than I could ever have hoped for. I feel forever grateful.